I'd like to call this public hearing to order. Good evening. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Logan? Here. Mr. Loscom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Notice is hereby given that Scranton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, October 23rd, or it should be October 25th, I believe, uh, at 6.15 p.m. in Council Chambers, second floor, Municipal Building, 340 North Washington Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. The purpose of said public hearing is to hear testimony and discuss the following file of council number 64 of 2012, approving the transfer of a restaurant liquor license currently owned by Kalani's Incorporated T slash A Little Mickey's Pasta House, 77 Fallbrook Street, Carbondale, Pennsylvania, 18407, license number R-14028, to pass Rush LLC for use at Big House Tobacco Outlet, located at 200 Greenridge Street, Scranton, PA, 18509, as required by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. Is there anyone who cares to address council? Since there is no testimony, I will adjourn this public hearing. As you were. <laughs> yeah. Let's just move along. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who have died in the last week, particularly our good friend Paul J. O'Donnell, loving husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and uncle who served in the Marine Reserve, and his dear family and many friends who suffer his loss. Also, please remember in your prayers our friend and dedicated city employee, Deb Torba, who underwent surgery this week. Roll call, please. 
Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Lasko? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. <coughs> 3A, Tax Assessor's Report, results from September 19, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, Tax Assessor's Report, Appeal Hearings from October 17, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, Minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Meetings held August 22nd and September 26th of 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, Minutes of the Composite Pension Board's regular meeting held September 26th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, Agenda for the City Planning Commission meeting held October 24th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, Lackawanna County Planning Commission Subdivision and Land Development Evaluation received October 15th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? I have one. Uh, the Westside Falcons Youth Organization will present its first annual Night at the Races uh, this Friday, October 26th, tomorrow evening, at Holy Rosary Hall in North Scranton. Uh, enjoy the fun, buffet, beer, beverages, and snacks included. Doors open at 6 p.m. Buffet starts at 6.30. Races begin at 7.00 and tickets are $15 per person. Uh, for more information, you can visit the West, uh, website, www.wsfalcons.com for more contact info. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I don't know if you saw, we received a, a note from um, Mr. Beasley at the uh, PPNL and it, it was uh, a kind of a caution for next week with the, it, it basically says that the potential from Hurricane Sandy is for damage and power outages and that PPNL has um, activated uh, emergency personnel, that there will be additional people in the area should there be power outages. Uh, during the storm thank you i just have um i just wanted to mention this i will be making a motion to amend the cdbg allocations um i'd like to thank everyone for their input we put this together and i just wanted to announce it now in case any of the residents and attendants had any questions um to bring up before the vote um the changes are i'm going to read them off in two sections the first one is the general fund items and the second would be the ones that are listed as public service as many of you know the two funding sources, you can only a certain amount can be used for public service. So the reductions are the City of Scranton OECD um, administration cost of the CDBG program will be reduced by $55,000. Um, sidewalk repairs for the Boys and Girls Club will be reduced by $32,000. And City of Scranton Parks and Recreation plans for splash pads, splash parks will be reduced by $300,000. The additions will be to Lackawanna Neighbors for Housing Rehabilitation, $32,000. Scranton Tomorrow, Master Business Plan, $10,000. And City of Scranton DPW Road Paving, $345,000. Um, the changes in the public service portion of the funding would be the reductions would be the United Neighborhood Center Scola Program, $10,000 and the Deutsch Institute Recreation Activities by $5,000. The offsetting increases will be for EOTC, the Adult Literacy Program, increased by $5,000, and the NeighborWorks PA Home Ownership Program will be increased by $10,000. And that is all for now. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'd like to acknowledge and thank Mr. Tom Welby for manning the ECTV camera this evening and making this broadcast possible. The 2012 election is fast approaching. As you go to the polls on November 6th, know that you do not need a photo ID to vote in this election. Please be sure to vote. The Pancreatic Cancer Action Network will hold its Cheers to Hope fundraiser on Sunday, November 4th from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Radisson Lackawanna Station Hotel in Scranton. A suggested donation is $35. Live entertainment includes the Fab Three, the East Coast Trio, Asia Lena, and the Cue Balls. 2012 honorees are Bill Shaykoski, Tammy Saunders, and former Mayor James Connors. Please support this worthy cause. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens participation. Our first speaker tonight is Andy Spiraglia. Andy Spiraglia, citizens Grant and fellow Cantonians. In our Sunday paper, there was an editorial about the commuter tax, where our dear newspaper decided it was a bad idea. But I like to say a little on the reasons they gave. It says, Council has failed to demonstrate serious, seriousness after resisting reform for a decade. You've been there for two years. That decade he was referring to was way back in the beginning. You're right. That council is where we are today, causing all the problems. I wish they gave the names of that council so people could actually see who it was. Okay, they also passed a budget two years ago that reduced taxes and hit commodity. commodity. We all know what that calamity was. You had no way of knowing exactly what was happening with the city budget. There was no audit. You voted on a tax decrease without an audit. I can understand that. But who do you blame for us not having an audit at the proper time? The administration. So whatever you want to say, they caused the calamity. Now let's go down there, number two. Rather than striving to cut costs that are driving the city problems, the, gover the government approved the new council with the public safety employees through 2017. They don't put in that article that they paid $15 million to get that contract. Nobody gives up $15 million like they did without some guarantee. Obviously, that's the reason they got the contract. Whatever you may see, that's what it looks like, and it probably is true. So they paid for their contract. Okay, council accelerated the crisis with delivery, forcing the default this summer of the Scranton Parking Authority. Commuters who work in downtown pay as much as $1,200 a year to park in SBA garages. They shouldn't have to bear for the costs of council. They use the word misfeasance. They claim that what you did was legal, but it wasn't right. How many days I stood out in the cold waiting to get to our dear council meetings? How many days did I pass through law, uh, metal detectors so I could speak on what was happening on the city? If there was any mis misfeasance, it should have been with the Scranton Times for not reporting it at that time. Let's go on to another one. According to the Pennsylvania Economy League, more than 70% of city property owners pay less than $500 in property taxes. A commuter earning $50,000 a year then would pay more in taxes and spend than most city property owners. That may be true. I won't say it's this or that. But I was glad to pay it because my wage stack was high long before you even thought about a commuter tax. To keep my grandmothers in their homes, my mothers in their homes, without being burdened by high taxes. That is the reason why we did that. Nobody ever come to you and cried about paying the wage tax. 
And the reason we didn't cry about it, because the property taxes were kept low for our mothers and grandmothers. Okay, the premise that the premise that the tax really covers the service for the community, forget about that, that's ridiculous. I mean, we know that if somebody drives in the city, goes to work, they do the work, I mean, their company pays for taxes, they pay for lighting, they pay for this and that, and they get the heck out of the city. So that, that's not it. Council wants to shake down commuters after refusing to participate with the suburban governments in joint planning and failing to pursue consolidated service. That's that stupid plan again, falling in love with the Abingtons. Why don't they don't give that up? I'll never know. That's ridiculous. If we want to go somewhere, let us stretch out our hands to our communities that surround us. I go from one street, I'm in Taylor. I go from another street, I'm in Dunmore. I go from another street, I'm in Taylor. There's where we should be stretching out our hands, not over the mountain. I mean, all they want to do is set up so they stay clean air and we get all the garbage down here. In fact, uh, paper ran up there too. And they said, that they come off with the bad part about it. The better cost is if his, this bad decision would not I'll be able to vote against the people who tax them. Well, I can understand that too. I hate to see anybody tax without being able to come here and say, I voted for you or I didn't vote for you. I believe what happens to us is what we deserve for not paying more attention to what was happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Les Spindler. Good evening, Council Les Spindler, City Resident, Homeowner, Taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, last week, Mr. Spragley was talking about the commuter tax and asking if uh, federal judges would be exempt or the local judges would be exempt. Or, I don't know why anyone be, would be exempt. If you live out in the city and you work here, it doesn't matter if you're a federal judge or whatever. I think you should be paying the tax. Now, uh, I don't know if Council looked into that. If Attorney Hughes would know, would, would these judges be exempt? Or is that a perk of being a federal judge, or do they have to pay the tax? Well, it appears from um, at least what we've read in uh, a newspaper article, no one is exempt. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a bunch of street lights are out uh, on the Linden Street Bridge. I have this in writing. I will give it to Ms. Okay. The Lindy Street Bridge and the inbound lanes, the whole, the whole lane, is, the lights are out. And on the McDade Expressway, this has happened before, from 7th Avenue up to Main Avenue, those are all out again. I think they were out once, and I think they fixed them. And I, don't, I don't know if it's a line, or that, I don't think all the bulbs could be burned out at one time. Hmm. It's, uh, as I said, from 7th Avenue up to Main Avenue. And uh, I do have this. I'll give it to Ms. Ms. Marciano. Uh, moving on, well, it was nice to see in the paper the other day that the city received $11.3 million. And, uh, hope they'll take care of things for a while, but you know what? We can't keep counting on borrowing. That's what got it into this problem in the first place. Uh, we have to uh, start bringing in different revenue sources. And uh, I have to talk about what Bob Bolas has spoken about for years, and nobody's listened. He brings up that leachate line that runs through the city. Like, like he said, you can put a 1% fee on that. He has brought this up for years and years and years, and nobody's looked into it. I don't know why. That's a good revenue source. I give the credit to Mr. Bolas for bringing it up. I think we should definitely look into that. And uh, what did I mention last week? was it the electric city sign. I think by not having it lit all the time, I think we could save a lot of money. I don't know why that sign has to be lit all night. Who's gonna see it at three or four in the morning? Put it on the timer to go when the sun goes down and have it shut off at midnight or whatever. Or just have it lit on special occasions. Why does it have to be lit all, all through the night? It doesn't make any sense. I would. Uh, we want to know what the electric bill is for that a month, too, if council could look into that. 
No, he says, it could save a lot of, I don't know why it has to be lit all through the night. I just think it's a waste of money. That sign must use a lot of electricity. Um, Mr. Spindler, if you would give that suggestion also to... Well, I don't have that in writing. I'll, well, we can give you time and I'll give you a okay. pen and... I have a pen. Okay. And there is something else. I'll, uh, I'll write down a couple of things and I'll, I'll give it to Ms. Marcy on the way. Great. Okay. Thank you for your time. That's all Thank I have to you. Know. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Bullis. Good evening, Council. Bob Bolas, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We had several questions tonight, and hopefully we could get some answers. You know, I went by the old ice box or whatever it's called now. It's your new Turkey Hill out front. Has anything or any consideration been made to terminate that agreement with them down there, where we get a dollar a year that the mayor put this stupid agreement together? Has anybody considered? filing or pushing legislation to amend that agreement down there so we could actually get the money we're owed instead of these people being unjustly enriched at our expense while we're the laughing stock of the country. Yet we watch that down there every day while they could lease and they could develop and they can make money. And the next question, is that a tax exempt property down there? Does anybody know if they that's a KOZ or a nonprofit? I believe it was. It um, still is. It's a KOZ zone. It was given a KOZ status on the basis that when it was declared a KOZ, there was supposed to be a brand, there's supposed to be a bank administration office in there that would employ 600 people. There were other things that were stated uh, in that to get a KOZ status, and there's a Turkey Hill there. This is up to the solicitor's department. Um, I've been looking into it. Um, I intend to go over it with uh, Paul Kelly. I know he did express some concern about it also. So I've, I've looked at it, um, and I will be discussing with Paul Kelly. Okay, thank you, because, you know, as we drive by and we see more and more going on at our expense, you know, it gets ridiculous. And I hope Paul Kelly finally gets in gear and does something for our benefit and mostly for the other benefit of others. I've been to the commissioner's meetings throughout the county, attended them. And what puzzled me is why I didn't see any council members or more people out there coming to the meetings or coming to council meetings. Everybody's standing back and yapping about taxes being put on them. You know, the commissioners asked the question, you know, if you have suggestions, you know, give them to us. No more than council. If you have a suggestion, Bring them to us. You know, the council or the commissioner, they're not gods. They're not all knowing of everything. And people have suggestions. But don't sit home and hide with them and come out bitching about them later on when you can come here and maybe make a difference by actually coming before a council or the commissioners and expressing your ideas. Everybody has an idea. You know, come forward. This is our community not just Scranton, because now we're going to suffer even more. We're suffering now in Scranton, now we're going to suffer because we live in Lackawanna County. It's getting to be an absurdity at the expense of the people. And I look and I ask them questions, which I raised, uh, you know, as a business in the uh, county here, why would I want to expand? Why do I want to even bring anything here when all I do is keep looking at more and more taxes and then sit around and watch Scranton here with nonprofits making millions and millions of dollars, spending millions, taking land off the tax rolls, like the university, like the leachate line that comes here. Now the landfill's taking in a thousand tons of Marcella shale a day, and they're treating it. Now they're going to go to 2,000 tons a day, not counting the garbage that goes in there. Now leachate's coming through to the sewer authority, which treats it. I've said time and time again, review the contract that was there. Look at the original contract that somehow just disappeared that you can't find it here to review. The original contract that governed what the leachate line was about. 
you could assess a fee as a host community on that leach aid line, and you could bring in millions and millions of dollars. It's time you do something about it. These are suggestions, but nobody takes them anywhere because they're being controlled by the big bullies with money. And that's what's wrong with our city. And we've talked about rubber stampers and what went on, and of course they were controlled, bought, and paid for. And it made a big difference in where the city got here. It just didn't get here. It's been on a long, long snowball over the hill for many, many years. But you have assets out there. And I've spoken and I've requested. I have not yet seen a legal document that's been presented that disputes anything I've said here or other citizens. You could put a fee on a university. You can't tax them. As the commissioner said, you cannot put a tax on, but you could raise and put a fee on. No more than you put a fee, and I say you, I say the administration and councils of the past, put a garbage fee on us. We pay taxes to get our garbage dumped. Yet you put a fee on us and had no qualms about it. That was the taxation without representation. Now why is it that everybody is so scared and intimidated because of the political power that goes on to put a fee that would go against everybody in the community, not just the university or the other nonprofits, but everybody. Think of the millions you have, and then you ignore all that. Constantly, constantly ignore it, for whatever the political reasons or for whatever the personal reasons. You gotta remember, you represent the people in the community. And you wanna put this commuter tax on. That's a nail in our coffin, because I don't think anybody in an outlining community out there should have to pay for the stupidity and the mis fiscal mismanagement we in the city allowed to happen and penalize them. To come in here and pay for what we squandered. Millions from the golf course, we didn't even have a pool open. It was squandered, it was there, but it was squandered, mismanagement. NAOG, mismanagement. I could go on and on and on what's going on in this community. Thank when you, is council or this administration finally going to do something about the fiscal mismanagement and not penalize the people and outlining communities who come here? Do you expect a business to take an employee to do the financial responsibility for the city and collect the money at their expense? I don't think so, and I don't think they should. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joan Hodawanitz, and I apologize if I have incorrectly pronounced that. One of these days I'm going to change that name. No, my name is Joan Hodawanitz, and I'm a Scranton taxpayer. Mrs. Evans, I thank you for your timely response to the email I sent you last week. Uh, asking you the questions that I asked yesterday at the county commissioners meeting and that is the churches and schools that the Diocese of Scranton closed and I do mean closed not periodic worship sites have they been placed on the tax rules and the answer given to me by the commissioners was we don't know we'll look into it but we're kind of thinking that maybe they get taxed once they're sold. Now, have you any idea how long it's going to be before some of these properties are sold? I, I will be long dead. But I did some uh, research on the internet, and lo and behold, I found out that Luzerne County has been taxing closed churches and schools and rectories and parking lots for the last year or two. Times Leader, uh, November 2009, closed churches to be taxed. The Standard Speaker, uh, let's see, June 2010, Diocese of Scranton receives tax assessments on four former Hazel Township worship sites. Uh, June 2011, Luzerne County begins taxing some church properties. Uh, also June of 2011, the National Catholic Reporter, the tax man cometh, Scranton Diocese to pay taxes on closed churches. Also in these articles, you'll find references to the Diocese of Allentown being taxed by Northampton and Corbin counties. 
Now, I think, uh, I understand from reading these that the diocese is not happy camper and is challenging, if not the, the tax uh, at all, they're challenging the assessments. They think they're too high. But it brings me back to my basic question. Are the churches and schools and rectories and parking lots that are no longer serving a religious function in Scranton proper and in Lackawanna County overall, are they on the tax rolls? Now, I went on the county's website trying to find St. John the Evangelist Church, and I couldn't find it. So I suspect they are not. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, are we passing up a potential significant revenue stream that Luzerne and Northampton and Carbon counties are tapping into, and we are not? Um, I just, I think this deserves to be looked into. I, you know, I mean, I'm certainly not a tax lawyer. I took maybe one or two tax courses in my career. But this question needs to be asked, especially if our neighboring county is sending out tax bills. Mm -hmm. I emailed uh, the bishop and his financial advisor, and I haven't gotten a response. Uh, so I do not intend to drop this. I intend to keep researching this and finding out what's going on. If somebody can show me where it is written that they are exempt until they are sold, I'll keep quiet. But if not, I want them on the tax rolls, and if they are, if we are owed interest and penalties, I want every dime of it too. I've been paying taxes since 1967, and if I can arrange to pay my taxes, the diocese can also. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, if I could, just to comment on that, the rule generally is as long as the building is vacant for one year, mm -hmm. it's not put back on the assessment rolls. However, any time, once the year is up and it's not sold, it can then be assessed because it's a vacant building and it's no longer used for church purposes. This is not a council issue. No. This is an issue with the Lackawanna County Assessor's Office. And that's where I and was that's, yesterday. That's, they're the ones that have to go out and they're the ones that have to go out and, and assess the properties. Be it a school, be it a church, no matter what denomination, it's up to them. And that's, that's where it goes. If the commissioners say they don't know what's going on, it's up to them to find out from the assessor's office where it is. Well, that's what they said they were going to do. But I thought you should know, because this could be a potential significant stream of revenue if they need to, because I can tell you, like St. John's the Evangelist on Pittston Avenue, that closed in June of 2010. Okay, that's over two years. Yes. Okay, so I'm sure, I also went on the diocese website and looked at their list of closed churches. Do you know how many churches in Scranton have closed since 2004? No. 11. Since 2009, five. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm wondering how many of them have been closed over one year and have never been open again. I'm not talking worship sites. Yes. I'm talking closed churches. Thank you. Anybody got any idea how much Bishop Hannon should be assessed for? I walk past that every day because I live at the Forum, and believe me, that's closed. Oh, it's been closed many years. Yes, and uh, thank you for your time. And I did receive your email, and I also sent a letter to our tax collector, Bill Courtright, seeing if uh, he knew anything additional about uh, any revenue being collected from churches that are no longer being used as a place of worship. And schools. And schools. Uh, Mrs. Creek, could, could we send a letter to County Assessor? I, I would like to mention, Mrs. Evans, that last summer, we actually, I actually had a meeting in our office with the Assessor's Office and two of the gentlemen that do their assessment and at that time they were going to go out and look at all the properties in the city also our city planner was there and we have not heard back but i i know that you had directed us to do that and yes and if that's why i'd like a letter sent to mm -hmm. the assessor's office requesting the assessments of all of those properties the churches, parking lots, social halls, schools. Thank 
you. And our next speaker is Ozzie Quinn. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Ozzie Quinn, Scranton Taxpayers Association. Uh, attorney Hughes, uh, I really appreciate the work that you've been doing on the recovery plan. And it shows you at every meeting, you know, how much intelligence you have in government, you know. And uh, when I saw where you were trying to get paid above and beyond your contract, and they started throwing everything at you with the kitchen sink, okay? Yes, yes. Uh, tell me that too. And, but, but yet, you know, down the street, attorney Carl Greco, who is a neighbor of the Linets, the Doherty's, okay? Uh, he has made, he, they made him a millionaire at OECD as, as the, what's name, as a solicitor. At one time, he, they wouldn't accept what he what was above and beyond his contract, so he filed for court. Of course, they didn't file any, what's name, any defense against it, so no contender, he just got the money, you know? So, uh, <laughs> It's, it's not right, you know, it's who you know here. A million, a million dollars, that's a lot of money they make around here. You know, uh, I look on, a, on the website, the mayor's website, and he says the major construction, he, he spent $115 million. Uh, infrastructure improvements, $68 million. Downtown revitalization, 26.8. Nayog Park, 1.9 million. Neighborhood parks, Revitalization, 2.25 million. Miscellaneous proposed projects, 0.44 million. The grand total of 214.4 million dollars. That's a lot of money going out the front door, you know? Since when, 2000, probably most of it all, as you said, last week, 2003 to 2008, when the councils were rubber stamped and everything, you know? Now, Mr. Logan, I don't see anything in here in community development block grant for housing rehabilitation. When this 7B was introduced, okay, I spoke, I don't know if you were here or not, about uh, the lack of housing rehabilitation money, CDBG, and I gave a, an email, a copy of the email to Jamie in regards from the OEC director, Linda Avery, to the effect that she, said that there was no money spent. The Doherty administration doesn't spend money, CDBG money on rehousing rehabilitation. Now, you got brownouts in the neighborhood, you got potholes in the neighborhood, that got the, 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 the curbs falling apart, the housing falling apart. You know, when I want to read tonight, I propose, I recommend it, that you try to get a consultant on board at OECD to put together an OECD housing rehabilitation program. Now, I don't want to be fed the line. I've, I've been around too long for about the, about the home program and about lack of running neighbors, okay? Now, I mean a good comprehensive neighborhood programs, like block by block, all through. Because if we don't, pretty soon the housing value in the city is going to be so that people want People want the, they're all be going out to the assessor's office. Yet, I see that you haven't put anything in there for housing rehabilitation. What, what, what was the reasons that uh, Mrs. Abley gave you? Um, we, I spoke to Ms. Abley through email on the phone, and actually we, we asked this, this question, I believe it was three or four weeks ago, right here during a caucus. And what she brought up was, you know, the use of the funds. Um, she brought up, and I, I know you're not going to like this answer, that the housing rehabilitation has been through Lackawanna neighbors and through basically they're outsourcing it, so to say. Um, for them to do a consultant, that would be an administrative decision on their part. If they want to make a recommendation, because what you're doing here, you're letting this city fall apart. There's no, there are, people are not making money in this city and they need the loans, small interest loans or grants to help them to put a roof, maybe to put some siding or put their porches up on things. My God, you know that. You, you drive around Scranton. Mm -hmm. hey, don't let her kid you. She doesn't know what the heck she's talking about. She's, 
She got $11 million in an audit that's hanging over her head. And it, uh, she speaks, she speaks now with a forked tongue. She speaks who's paying her, and I know who's paying her, okay? So and she's a nice lady and all that, and I have all the respect in the world for her, but uh, we're not doing the right thing for the people in the city of Scranton. You see all this money, I don't know. Look, at, for instance, $16 million went into the Southern, uh, Southern Union uh, headquarters. $16 million, because we're going to get the national headquarters here. We got zero, okay? Now, just think about what that would have done if we did some, if we put that into rehabilitation and housing. We gotta start looking at it. We can't, we gotta get the back porch of things, not just the front porch, okay? Thank you very much, and I don't mean to be a wise guy to you, but, you know. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think, it, it, I hope, I wish you would send a letter to the mayor and tell him to please, he should know, if he's the mayor, for 10 years, what other cities are doing. He get a, he's got his head under the covers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And Mr. Quinn, I, I, I <laughs> certainly agree with you, just by walking through a neighborhood or driving through a neighborhood. You're my we elect you, and I expect something to be done. Well, as far as a position being created, that could only be done by the administration. Well, I expect You know, they, they receive, and I know they want 20% of the funding of CDBG to go for administration. We geared it back to 17.5, and I think that's what we used the last three years. HUD or the program director of HUD, CDBG, and the mayor, and discuss an issue like this? I would love to have the mayor in here to discuss that issue. Well, you know, I, I, would, I don't know. You're the councilman. You should call that meeting. I shouldn't be just left hanging up there, and next year we're going to be here again in October, and we're going to be talking about the same thing, and there's going to be houses shot down again, and there'll be brown houses, and there'll be streets uh, falling apart. And I'll, make, I'll make that request under motions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. I just, I wanted to add, though, that um, council did increase the allocations for acquisition, lead abatement, and rehab of six blighted vacant homes in Scranton neighborhoods, as well as um, giving funding to neighbor works of Northeastern Pennsylvania to assist city residents facing issues of mortgage delinquency and foreclosure. Uh, I know the, uh, the administration in OECD had not allocated any funding toward that purpose, and council funded it. Yes, we do. I don't think I don't think the people of the council can grasp grasp what I'm trying to say. You know? You know, all she has to do is go down as far as Wolfgar or Avondown or Chinese cities to find out about them. Okay. We will. Thank you. Doug Miller? Good evening, Council Doug Miller Spranton. Good evening. Good evening. I, uh, listening to Ozzy here uh, for a few minutes, I, I do agree with a lot of what he said tonight uh, that we do need to turn our attention to the neighborhoods. And we've been talking about that for decades now. It's nothing new. Um, it's, a, it's an area where the administration sort of, uh, in their tenure, has swept under the rug, uh, focusing on the downtown. You heard, you heard the numbers tonight from Ozzy, the millions invested in the downtown. And certainly when you drive downtown and you look around, um, you kind of ask yourself, where did those millions go? Because it certainly doesn't look like a downtown that uh, an investment was made in. Um, you know, and then when you drive through the neighborhoods and you see the, the homes in deterioration, the roads in deterioration, the curbs and sidewalks, or, or lack of curbs and sidewalks, it certainly makes you open your eyes. And, and you certainly ask yourself a lot of questions. And, and I'm confident uh, with, with the council that we will look in all avenues to make the necessary investments and help those that are struggling. Certainly those that are struggling um, need help. And as a city, whatever we can do to help them, I'm certain that we'll, we'll uh, look at all those avenues. Obviously, there are people that are struggling. And there are legitimate reasons as to why certain properties are in the conditions they're in. Uh, people just can't afford upkeep them, and, and some people need a little assistance. And if we do have that ability, I think we need to pursue it. 
But I'm hoping within the coming months and, and certainly years to come, uh, we will certainly focus our attention on the neighborhoods because that's where it starts, in the neighborhoods. And then you move forward from there. Um, on to the issue that I discussed last week, uh, dealing with public safety and Engine 7 over in Westside. Uh, just to give everybody an update, I'm sure we're all well aware, it's still closed. Uh, we're now, I believe, two weeks from the meeting that was held over at Kaiser Valley where the chief attended and took questions from the uh, audience. 88% of the time in the last three and a half months that engine's been shut down, uh, jeopardizing the health and safety of all those throughout Westside, including those up on West Mountain, who we know uh, there's a lack of water, and certainly if, uh, God forbid, there were a uh, tragedy up there, um, I think we would have a difficult time responding. Uh, last night, uh, I was made aware that there was a kitchen fire uh, over off of Crisp Avenue, and I'm told that the response time was approximately nine minutes, and I find that to be totally unacceptable, and I believe that we all should find that to be unacceptable because there's no excuse for it. This goes back to the failure of the mayor and Chief Davis and their inaction to open this station. The chief said it himself. He made the decision to close the engine. Well, if he has the ability to close stations, then as I said last week, he obviously has the ability to reopen stations, and there's no reason why Engine 7 should not be open. There's no justification for it. The excuse that we're worried about two years from now with the SAFER grant, as I said last week, that's absurd. It's absurd to think two years from now, well, we need to worry about the present. Here's a, a, a perfect case in point right here, a fire last night that took nine minutes to respond to. And we're going to go ahead and look and, and wait, wait for two years from now? No, we need to worry about today, now. And the fact that we gave $3.5 million back, there's no justification for it. Like I said last week, it's stupidity. It's stupidity on Chief Davis's part, and it's stupidity on the mayor's part. We have people making these decisions who have no qualifications whatsoever to determine what stations are closed. I believe the term, uh, the dartboard method's been brought up before. That's exactly what's going on here. It's the dartboard method. Let's sit down. What one do we want to close today? Okay, let's throw the dart. Well, 88% of the time it's been engine seven, so the dart seems to know where it's going. But it's totally unacceptable. And I encourage all residents in Westside to continue to pursue this issue and, and to hold the mayor accountable, to hold the chief accountable, and demand that this station's open. I'm gonna to continue to bring this up every week until that's, that engine company's open. Because I will not live in Westside and have my life at risk or my fellow Westside neighbors' lives at risk. I will not stand for it. And I expect action to be taken, and I expect it to be taken today. Uh, Onto the capital budget, it was addressed last week, and we know capital budgets, they're simply wish lists, and majority of the time we, we usually don't realize a lot of what we have on our capital budget, because it is a wish list. But I just wanted to bring up one of the points that was made last week. I do agree with Council's uh, amendment uh, to the 2013 capital budget, particularly uh, your decision to delete the splash parks uh, in the community. I believe it's at Novembrino Park, uh, Capelsa Avenue, and uh, there may have been one more you might, uh, well, maybe it was only those two. But I never supported the idea of a splash park. Um, I don't see the, the point of it, the relevance in it. Uh, these pools were built to be just that, swimming pools. I believe the children uh, deserve the opportunity to utilize those pools. And the fact that the kids had to suffer last summer uh, in heat and not be able to uh, utilize those facilities um, I found that to be uh, irresponsible on the administration's part due to their fiscal mismanagement. And I'm hopeful that next summer uh, the children will be able to utilize those pools and they will be open and uh, uh, the taxpayers will get what they pay for. And finally tonight, on to the, uh, the commuter tax. This seems to be a very uh, popular issue right now. Uh, certainly a variety of opinions. Um, and as I've stated before, I may sound repetitive at times, but the people need to once again know that these weren't easy decisions that were made throughout the recovery plan process. It took a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, cooperation between council and the mayor. Cooperation that at times we didn't think we would have. But leadership was put forth and council knew that in order for us to move the city forward and to take the steps necessary, we had to put politics aside in the interest of the taxpayers and, co and work cooperatively with the mayor. And that's exactly what took place. Certainly. Many parts of the recovery plan are popular. And I know they're not popular with council, but you had to make those decisions. Raising taxes is not an easy decision to make, especially a year before a re-election. But as I stated, when, we, when we're in opposition, 
with the commuter tax. I think city residents need to recall one thing. By opposing the commuter tax within the city, I think you're essentially asking for an additional tax increase. And I certainly don't think that's something we want to see. So I would just ask those who are in opposition, particularly those outside of the community, it's a three-year plan. We're asking everyone to pay their fair share. You're utilizing our essential services, our roads, our bridges, and our public safety. And as we like to talk about so many times here about paying your fair share, that's exactly what this is. We need to be Thank creative, you. and we need to be innovative. And it starts here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gerard Hedman. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Gerard Hetman from the Lackawanna County Department of Community Relations. To begin this evening, I do have some handouts for members of Council. May I please approach? Yes, of course. Thank you. As I believe members of Council may be aware, the Lackawanna County Commissioners are in the process of crafting, reviewing, and adopting a general fund budget for the year 2013. This evening, with the handout you have in front of you, I will explain and provide some background into two key areas of focus that this budget seeks to address. First, Lackawanna County currently has an unemployment rate of 9.3 percent, one of the highest among the counties in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The Lackawanna County Commissioners believe, and we hope you will agree, that this is an unacceptable situation for the residents and taxpayers of Lackawanna County. With this in mind, the Lackawanna County Commissioners, in this current budget cycle, plan to implement a blueprint for job creation with six key points that I will briefly provide some information on. First, a job creation incentive fund will provide a small amount of financial assistance to businesses that are either looking to locate in or for existing businesses to expand their workforce in Lackawanna County, covering the last part of that sometimes very long road in community and economic development and job creation. Second, creation of a life sciences technology corridor will see the county partner with the Commonwealth Medical College, as well as other institutions and businesses already in Lackawanna County to attract jobs in the medical, scientific research, and bioscience initiatives to keep, as we say, our best and brightest working right here in our communities in Lackawanna County. Third, a community reinvestment fund will help all municipalities in Lackawanna County to pay for some of those small but significant upgrades in our neighborhoods, sometimes things such as parks and recreate, public recreation opportunities that increase, they may look small, but those things increase our quality of life by leaps and bounds, as I know we can all understand in our neighborhoods. Fourth, high-tech innovation in the form of the county-wide wireless network that I spoke about during my last presentation at Council, which will be accessible to municipal governments as well as emergency service agencies and to private sector employers who otherwise would have to pay an astronomical amount to implement the same technology and which will save county taxpayers money by replacing existing infrastructure that is paid for through the county budget in terms of county IT and wireless communication. Our merchant revitalization program will help attract retail businesses to downtown Scranton in a partnership with the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. And lastly, infrastructure investment will continue investment into county roads and bridges in our county to help provide and pave the way in terms of the physical infrastructure for commerce to continue, grow, and flourish throughout Lackawanna County. If you flip the sheet over, you'll see four key areas of budget challenge that the commissioners are committed to challenge to pursuing in this budget cycle and to save money in future budget cycles. First, the rising cost of prisons and the operation of the Lackawanna County Prison, which includes meeting a federal staffing mandate now in effect to continue operation lawfully of the Lackawanna County Prison. Second, contractual obligations in the forms of binding contracts that include contractual wage increases with several, several segments of the county workforce. Third, rising health care costs, which we know are not unique to Lackawanna County, but also to the city of Scranton and also any public or private sector employer that provides health care coverage for employees. And last but not least, restoring the county's bond rating, credit rating, to a level above junk bond status. And this is, a, in particular, a key point. By restoring the credit rating, which includes both completing the on-time audit, the first time in over 35 years that the county audit has been completed on time, and also the creation of a reserve fund, uh, a budget surplus, that will help restore the county's credit rating to a level above junk bond status, therefore eliminating a $1 million surveillance fee tied to past borrowing 
because the county's in junk bond status, that fee has to be paid every year. And as Commissioner Wanzak is fond of saying, the county taxpayers get nothing for that $1 million. It's just a fee that goes to a credit rating agency, in effect taking the money and burning it uh, right in front of you. So by taking these steps now, we can save that million dollars after this budget cycle for future challenges and therefore reduce the need to pay that fee and eliminate the need to pay that fee in future years. And you can see the bottom line on these four budget challenges to meet these in this current budget cycle is approximately $4.8 million. 3.1% of that, $3.1 million in that figure will be met in this current proposed budget with a proposed 4% property tax increase equal to 2.5 mils. Um, the remainder will come through a reduction in county workforce, which does include some layoffs, as well as elimination of vacant positions, and also other budget savings that the commissioners, in cooperation with county department heads, have worked hard to achieve. Um, as you can see, the commissioners are committed to not just funding these initiatives now and taking care of these problems, but therefore, in several cases, saving issues down the road from coming up that have sometimes lingered and caused budget increases. So I will be available now and after the meeting to answer any questions, few any questions from council members or the general public that they may have about the county budget process. We saw several residents come to the budget hearings that we held throughout the county last week, and I know some people may not have had a chance to come out, so we do we appreciate any questions or suggestions, as Mr. Bull said, and uh, we can always take whatever questions you have. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Um, as everybody's well aware, I've been coming here a very long time. Um, and I do really appreciate every person who attends these meetings because without them, um, there'd be no dialogue between the residents of this city and its government, even though many times we get no response um, or no action. But. Um, you know, people are, the Scranton Times, I didn't get a chance to read their article on the commuter tax, uh, but I did listen to Andy speak. And, you know, I, I appreciate their opinion, but I think their opinion isn't correct either. Um, you know, we have to be careful that, uh, in my opinion, the city of Scranton isn't on firm ground, it's in a marsh. and. Um, if this commuter tax goes through, in my opinion, the city will be in quicksand. Um, you know, I've, after coming to council meetings for so long and hitting so many doors and talking to so many people, there's many questions uh, that I have on how people could be so misinformed on so many different things. Um, the recovery plan that the mayor put forward initially, read it, Scrant Public Library. There was no recovery in that plan. That was a plan of self-destruction. Um, you know, you read other plans, SAPA, I've read that. I've asked other people who are opposed to the plan if they've read it, they haven't. I've asked people that are for the recovery plan if they've read that also, and they haven't. Um, I mean, you just look at this city and see what's going on, and you've got to separate fact from fiction. And where the city is right now, I don't know. You know, the Scranton Times did an article of uh, the council members and some others leaving the Lackawanna County Courthouse for unfunded debt. That's a mistake. We can't even carry the debt load we have now. Everything's in trouble. Um, you know, council is not the place to find the solutions to our problems because I'm not going to single this council out. This, this city has been in trouble for decades and council didn't answer the call. And now, I, don't, I just, you know, we talk every week about no curbs, no sidewalks, general deterioration of the, of the neighborhoods. Properties in the city selling for $50,000 that you couldn't buy for $200,000 in the Abingtons. Or basically in a lot of other places. 
And, uh, you know, the thing that I don't understand is when we, when we discuss certain issues, whether it's closing the firehouses, well, how are we going to fund the opening of these firehouses? I mean, it's a great thing to say that they should all be open, but where are the funds coming from? I mean, we've watched the city over, when I was a child, there was 100, over 100,000 people here. We're down to 70. Read the obituary page, and you'll see that a lot of people that have passed away at one time lived here. They fled the city. They just couldn't take anymore. You listen to people talk on talk radio occasionally. I catch it if I'm not working. There are people that just say they couldn't get out of here fast enough. And I just disagree with any judge that will agree to a commuter plan, commuter tax plan. We need development. I don't know where it's going to come from, but I will say this. The Southern Union, I don't know. They've got a water draw now in Carbondale for fracking. We're right in the heart of the, of the whole gas industry. Right off 167, there's billions and billions of dollars worth of gas there that's being produced to be shipped out of this area. We're right in the heart of it. So you know what? Maybe the Southern Union building, the plan wasn't strong enough to bring it all together. But I'm going to tell you something. It all fell apart, but we're right in the heart of all of it. And I think they're going to be drilling in fall soon, ransom, all the outlying areas. The Marcella Shell map is very large. Lots of money, okay? The Scranton Sewer Authority should be selling its processed water from the plant to the fracking uh, operations to raise net revenue to, to meet all the federal uh, requirements. I think the most important thing that we could put in place in this city is an administration from the top to the bottom that understands that we need to turn the city around. We need jobs. We need to create a job, an engine to create employment here. That's our problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else? Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Resident of Scrim. Um, I have a question on the 500 block of Lackawan Avenue. When is that park that we sunk so much money into behind the 500 block of Lackawan Avenue ever going to open? I, all I see is it's under lock and key. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's ready or if they're trying to get the uh, grass to grow or whatever. But it would be nice to hear about it. Um, I had a thought on that, kids on the expressway for John. Uh, we should notify the schools to at least tell their kids don't play on the freeway. <laughs> their parents might not <laughs> want them to do that, too. Uh, now, in the paper, Andy mentioned it, tax cuts. Uh, you know, we need to vote a little more carefully because, uh, and get out to vote. I've seen 22 percent in some districts where I work, precincts where I worked at elections, and uh, you know, at 22 percent, maybe people don't deserve a tax cut anyway. <laughs> you know, they obviously don't care whether they get a tax cut, and once again. I'd love to see some type of uh, study group on zoning to prevent any further tax exemptions, period. Uh, we lost, uh, we got two off the rolls, two were hospitals, they went uh, for profit, which might or might, might not be to your advantage anyway, but uh, being at their hospitals, but uh, also, uh, then there's been some expansions like we have on uh, Linden Street and Adams Avenue. That building, from what I could ascertain, paid about $25,000 a year, give or take a few. And that's, uh, that's where our taxes are going. So uh, we certainly can't we can't afford to wake up at 35% or 34% 
wake up someday and it's 45 or 50 percent. Uh, we just can't do it. And uh, the Pennsylvania Constitution also provides for uh, the fact that you cannot ask somebody to support a ministry. So if they're running around uh, lobbying for various laws on social issues and so forth, then you are being required through your tax, uh, the lack of taxation on these properties to support a ministry. And it specifically states that you do not have to, you cannot be required to support a ministry. So if they want to preach to their congregation, that's fine, but I see a little too much going on here with uh, they're outside of their churches preaching at the American public at large and lobbying for uh, laws that may or maybe not shouldn't be passed. And uh, a few, maybe a week or so ago, and it slipped my mind last week, driver's licenses. Uh, our state senator had some kind of conference on driver's licenses, and from what I could understand, they may go up as high as $130 in five years. So I would appreciate if we could get together with our city, could contact our state senator and uh, inquire on this, because $130 to subsidize Marcella Shale, which was never taxed, Lee just brought that up. Uh, I don't really care to fix the roads for Marcella Shale to walk around and go tax-free uh, and pay $130 for a driver's license or uh, to register my car. And a little criticism of Wall Street with bond statuses. They lost our money on pensions. From what I gather, the firemen and uh, police is about $25 million short thanks to Wall Street and their last collapse. And then they turn around and devalue our bond status. We're not going anywhere. There's no reason to devalue our bond status, period. There is no reason whatsoever to devalue the bond status because we can't pack the city up and move uh, away or, uh, if we file for bankruptcy, we're just going to get told to pay it. So uh, as far as Wall Street's concerned, cut the, cut the baloney. We don't need it. And uh, okay, uh, the golden parrot. Walmart, at one time, they stopped doing this. They uh, were taking peasant insurance money out on uh, policies out on their uh, employees in case they're killed in an accident on the way home and sticking the money in their own pocket. Peasant insurance. Excuse me, I've never been in Walmart, so, you know, too bad. Uh, and uh, Paulson and Sons, Paulson and Company, Elliott Management, and uh, Allied Management, Equity companies, they bought out Delphi, uh, supplies the big three, supplies Toyota. Uh, they made a thousand percent profit by holding the product of that company, which was the old AC Delco, and it switched to uh, supply major chains. Uh, all, the, all the big three manufacturers, plus a few. And uh, they shut down the plants. 24 out of 25 or something, and shipped them to uh, shipped them to uh, China. Gee, thanks, you know, thanks, private equity companies. And once again, a certain person, private equity company, was involved, and the uh, possible bottom line was 15.3 uh, million invested and 115 million dollars profit. Thank you, Mr. You're right. Have a good night. Thank you, and don't forget, bok bok. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy. Chrissy. Oh, Jack, you're there? You know what I'm talking about, Jack? You're there? Guess who's down there? Twenty is filming down there. They're filming down there down there today. They're filming down there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was Monday about 4 o'clock, 3 30. 3 o'clock, Jack. I feel like you know about that one, buddy. Thanks, Jack. Where's that nice hat I saw? Shirt. What are you 
doing with that? A H. Where, where's now you're for Abington Heights? Oh, you traitor! Hey, put, put that hat back on. He had the nice San Francisco hat, too. <laughs> Good evening, City Council. Good, e Good evening. Good evening. I'm Tom Lungvarsky. I see where your commuter tax is running into some resistance. I hope the people in the outlying districts realize all the services this city provides, not only our hospitals and such, but the colds, bus lines, and the uh, uh, Blackwana County Prison. We also have many uh, charities that make their residence here in the city of Scranton. Recently, I looked over my property tax and I saw where I was paying more to the county than I was to the city. Now, I know what the city provides for me, but I really don't know what the county provides. I also understand that they are going to raise the property tax again this year. I think with all the money that we provide to the county, I think they could maybe help us out with a, a few things. While I don't approve of the commuter tax, I don't think we should tax the working people. But I think the county owes us a little something for all the money that we send to them and all the services that we provide to them. 8.9%. That's gouging. I think maybe that should be investigated. It seems like it should be against some kind of a law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Joe Talamini, City of Scranton. Uh, I'll try to be brief. There's a couple of things that I'd like to know. Um, number one, all the pools, I imagine, but in York were closed last year. Is that yes. what it was? Yeah. Yes. I wonder if somebody could come up with facts and figures as to how much it would have cost to keep those pools open and also how much was expended on fireworks displays at York Park and in the other parts of the city. I'd like somebody to come up with those facts and figures for next week, please. And number two, I believe that there's a misinterpretation of 501c3 with regards to the octopus, uh, the university. Uh, I looked at their website, and they are way over the borders that were allotted them. And uh, to my understanding of 501c3, and I have been involved with them for several years, I don't believe that probably 40 to 50 percent of what they're claiming is tax exempt is tax exempt. It's got nothing to do with the educational system. It's got nothing to do with the church. Now, I think the housing, especially the housing that gobbled up on the hill, etc., I don't think they're tax exempt. I'm sorry. And I think too many people are afraid to take on the university. But uh, you know, you've got to take on the university or the citizenry, and I'd rather take on the university than the citizenry. And Mrs. Evans, you mentioned uh, the election. Uh, the county has already received over 5,000 absentee ballots, so this is going to be a pretty heavy election. The law states specifically, and this is the law which has not been enacted yet, that you must have a voter ID card. Now, that, I understand, is a moot point at this stage. However, according to the Election Commission, the election, <coughs> anybody who goes to vote will be asked to show a voter ID card. However, if they don't show the voter ID card, they will be allowed to vote because right. the law has not been passed. But that's official from the Election Commission. And again, as I said, over 5,000 absentee ballots, this was as of Saturday. So I'm sure there'll be close to six or 7,000. And I do ask people to go out and vote because this is a very, very important election. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.
Um, good evening, Council. Maurice Schumacher, citizen and taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I guess I'll start where Tom left off. I think that n almost 9% interest rate on that first unfunded borrowing is pretty staggering, and uh, I can hardly wait to see what the next one's going to be. Uh, it's also pretty sad that we're going to be starting 2013 with an almost $4 million deficit. Uh, uh, I don't know. I guess are we, are we planning to go for more unfunded borrowing next year? Is that the plan? No. Uh, there, in the realm of the recovery plan, there is no more unfunded borrowing to be undertaken for next year. <laughs> Okay. Was there a $4 million deficit presumed that would carry forward to next year? Yes, uh, there are $4 million worth of expenses that would be carried into next year. And that was assumed in the recovery plan? Yes. Okay. Um, and has the commuter tax been filed with the court yet? And is there a date? Uh, I can answer that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't have I'm sorry, I, there was a cough and I, it, it muted you. I've been on top of this daily. We haven't received a date as yet. Uh, I know that the city solicitor was down to the courthouse. And uh, in fact, even I believe yesterday following the court case, he visited the administrator's office once again to see if the date had been set, and it had not. The judges were going to meet and discuss, I guess, who would be. What, what date was it filed? Do you remember? I don't know. OK, thank you. But we should be hearing, what I, the last I heard is that we should be hearing any day, you know, I was hearing it would have been this morning, then this afternoon, possibly tomorrow morning. So as soon as we know, we definitely okay. make that public. Okay, thank you. To answer your question, I believe it was filed on Tuesday. Tuesday? Okay. Thank you, because I was, I think I checked Tuesday morning and it, and it hadn't been, so, but okay. Um, Next, a few follow-ups. Last week, uh, Mr. McGough, you promised <clears throat> to get me the size of the database and whether the city had requested of the county uh, the <clears throat> excuse me the mismatches between owner and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I didn't answer your question. I, I did not. I'm I'm sorry. I forgot. Uh, I okay. will write it down this time and hopefully oh. uh, Thank remember you. to do that. Okay, uh, and then on the on the ordinance, <clears throat> excuse me, on the ordinance, uh, I remember there was a, a a dialogue between Mr. McGough and Mr. Rogan on the what, that there would be only safety inspections uh, affiliated with it, but the ordinance itself says safety inspection is defined as will include but is not limited to a determination that each rental unit shall include an appropriate means of egress, smoke detection, hot and cold running water, heat and electricity. So it is not limited to those items. And um, I wonder why, when that's what was stated publicly. Was that the, your intent? Might or? I? Yeah. Why, sure. it's, why it was open-ended? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, when, um, when the, the, all the dialogue here was, because like, I, it was limited. Well, no, I, I think we did discuss that <laughs> at the time, but um, the purpose was that if, some, if somebody went for a safety inspection and there were other issues that outside of those five that were mentioned, that they could then contact you know, one of the city inspectors to have them examined as well. It was just to give, you know, if you went and there was noticeable structural damage or something and, you know, that's not included, you could then refer to the city inspectors. Well, I don't know. That sort of leaves it open-ended and, uh, I mean, yes, yeah, structural, but uh, there's plenty of other things that could be picked up too that 
could be a retaliation kind of thing that bothered me, but. I guess I'm, I look at it from the positive end <coughs> that uh, it may, y yes, they may find other things and they may be things that we want remedied. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, Mr. Joyce, I, I know the uh, unfunded debt amounts were discussed yesterday at the, at the hearing, but yes. uh, I, I know also that the only clear backup to that will be the audit, when we can actually see the list of the borrowings and what the principal amounts are, because I don't, I don't really understand that, and I, I didn't understand how it went from, like, I believe it was 37, and the um, and the distance from, from the ceiling went even a, further away from the ceiling when you added in the lease rental, which I don't understand. I would have naturally assumed it went the other way. So um, maybe there's some, something that you could explain next week on give us a list of the bonds. And then do you have a, a date for when we're going to, the public's going to be able to see that audit? Um, no, actually, uh, we just received a letter from Rossi and Rossi. They're waiting for some additional information from the city. And uh, once they receive that information, they'll provide their draft copy of the audit for council members to review. And then, of course, the exit conference, which will follow. OK, well, obviously well into the budget. Uh, obligations. Um, oh, and, and can you tell me now too, <clears throat> last week I, I talked about why the uh, controller's report for the month, month of August was more than what you said was had been collected through mid-September. I apologize. I, I still have to look into that, but I will look into that. Okay. And uh, have we any, um, any collections from the parking tax bills? I, I will also pose that question to our um, business administrator for further clarification, and hopefully I'll have that answer. OK. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. Rogan, you were here last week. I'm glad to see you back. I hope you're feeling better. Thank you. Uh, and continue to improve. Uh, back on, on 408 Cedar Avenue, uh, do we have any news to report on the collection of the balance? No, um, I do have to get in touch with Linda tomorrow on a couple other issues and I'll bring that one up as well. Okay, if I, if I may just continue on that for just a minute. Um, yes. And that is, last week it was stated that the two loans that were given, the, you were, the council was asking for hard proof that the taxes had been paid. Uh, I think that 408 Cedar Avenue, if that property was in fact part of the loan agreement, then the administrators are not doing their job. You don't go to a, to a sheriff's, excuse me, it was a, a judicial sale. You don't go to a judicial sale until you've been delinquent for a fair amount of time. So have they been checking? So I would like to recommend that you ask uh, OECD to provide annually uh, whether or not the tax has been paid on any, any property which is part of a, a loan agreement. And I'll be back with the rest next week and hopefully a little bit more voice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council? Jack, my friend, I saw you on TV. <laughs> Too much makeup. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk tonight. I didn't have my usual envelopes that Kelly makes fun of. But I guess I'm a bigger hand than Paul Savino. I just can't sit back there and not talk. You know, I heard a song the other day, a country and western song by a fellow named 
Tracy Lawrence, and the name of it was, find out who your friends are. And one of the lines in it goes something like, who's going to be there when the well runs dry? <clears throat> You know, that, that pertains to this city. Just, we just don't have a friend run anywhere. Just, just everybody is fighting us. Nobody, nobody seems to care about our plight with these nonprofits. What's it? It's been 20 years with Act 47, and, and all they've done is employ Mr. Cross. So he seems to have a job for life. Uh, Pell is a complete flop, you know, advocating raising taxes. You, you, you can't just keep attacking the people that have fulfilled the lifelong dream of home ownership. You, 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 we're the victims. You've got to go after these corrupt nonprofits immediately with legislation. There's no other way to go after them. Somebody was bragging to me the university built the science hall on a parking lot. Before it was a parking lot, there was a row of houses there. You know, they, they're not honorable people to deal with in the first place. I know council found that out last year. But I got a, I got a quick question for Attorney Hughes. Is there... Is there some way that the city can petition the county to, to have a small village or something go directly to the city from the whole county and, instead of trying to uh, get these wage taxes and, and everything else we're doing? That way it would be more money coming in from, from uh, uh, less amount from from people. I'll let you digest that if you, you know if you need. <laughs> I, I I don't know the legalities. That's why I'm asking it, if it was possible to find the the three commissioners. You know, but they don't answer phone call. Mr. O'Brien didn't want to answer a phone call. But you, you can't pass this city on to your children the way it is. I hear this all the time from people. They don't want to stay here. And we need them. I mean, desperately. <laughs> for, for taxpayers, if nothing else. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, like I've said so many times, I live here by choice. I was talking to a friend in Detroit this very week. Hey, you think you got problems? <laughs> yeah. he, he was telling me, he said, have you ever seen that hardcore porn? And I said, no, I've never watched it, really. He said, the whole city is like that. He said, it's just, it's just ungodly, crime-wise. And, and, Tax-wise and everything, I was telling them about the problem here. <laughs> it reminds me, many years ago, I was telling Father Fanucci the problem with my, my two boys at, at school in Moscow. They just disappear every day. I'd take them, they'd disappear. They'd on the school bus, they disappeared. I gave them a car, they disappeared. I couldn't get them in school. And he told me, Ronnie, you should go to some homes that I go to and listen to problems about children. He knew my two boys. He said, they're not a problem. That's what my friend said about Scranton when I was telling him all this. So evidently, he believes there's some light at the end of the tunnel for this city. But I know you all are out there like I am. You just don't have enough, as much time to talk to everybody at the grocery store and things. But it, 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 the people just want cuts. They don't want to see their friends lose their homes. You know, what's it, 20, 20 years, 25 years of Pell and, and Act 47? We've got a thousand people 
with foreclosures in the paper. 2,000 people not paying taxes. A real estate man said there's about 5,000 pieces of property for sale. There's thousands more of empty apartments and abandoned houses. You could just lay all this, almost uh, every bit of it, to these lousy businesses that hide under the guise of, of nonprofit institutions. And again, you, you need to go through the the nonprofits in the in this city. It's unbelievable what, what's hiding behind the guise of being a nonprofit. Gas stations and bars aren't nonprofits. Their business is making a lot of money, just like the university is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else? Mrs. Craig? 5A, motions. Mr. McGough, do you have any motions or comments tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, first, uh, one of the, uh, the, the legislation on the big house to tobacco shop, I, um, I have a number of questions, and I, I understand that uh, Attorney Hughes had gotten some information about it. Um, but I, I would like to at least pose the questions now, and perhaps when we get to the legislation, um, some of them could be addressed, if not all of them. Um, I, was, I was told that at one time this was a roll your own um, cigar or cigarette lounge, and that recently the machine, rolling machine, I guess, was confiscated by the state. Um, I don't know if that was for some violation or what the, the deal may be. I believe it was a tax issue. Okay. The cigarettes are taxed at a different rate than just buying tobacco. So what happened was, and this, I was speaking to a bunch of neighbors today on this issue actually as well. What the company was doing was people would go in and they would purchase tobacco and they would purchase filters and they would purchase tubes and then they would be allowed to use the machine for free. By purchasing each part individually, they circumvent the cigarette state cigarette tax. I see. That's why it was repossessed by the state. Okay. So it was one question answered, but it, it certainly leads to some other <laughs> questions if they were doing that to evade paying taxes um, or having their customers pay. Uh, the other thing I was told was that uh, when this was introduced last week, that they, the place began remodeling and that uh, no, no visible permits for, for the remodeling. I think that we should, you know, see if that's taking place uh, or whether they have received permits or whether they need to have permits. Um, also, I was told that it, they were talking about it being a selling food, but yet until um, there's no commercial kitchen in the building. So I don't know how much food they would be providing um, as a, a restaurant or a lounge. Uh, I have some questions about parking, uh, availability, if it was in fact going to be a, a restaurant or a lounge. Um, and, and I guess the the conclusion that I was coming to is that this this was starting to sound from some of the things that were said this was starting to sound more like a package store as opposed to a restaurant that this was going to be a place where they sold cigarettes and six packs um, which I don't know if that's something that we want or you know that I would be in favor of doing. Um, so just some questions, uh, and when we get to the legislation, perhaps we can discuss them. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention was- Do you want me to comment now? Yes. If, if you, you know, if it's easier now. This is a restaurant license. Uh, what happens with the restaurant, restaurant license is that it must have um, food service, must have a full kitchen. Uh, it must have tables and 30 chairs uh, so that it qualifies under the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board rules and regulations as a restaurant. Uh, 
-hmm. That's what it must have inside. All the other issues, I mean, to get your liquor license. Right. And they would be inspected. They have to put their application in um, that, you know, f in, in order to have the restaurant liquor license transferred to there. What they're doing, this would be a person to person, place to place transfer. It's going from two different, from a seller to a buyer. It's coming from outside of Scranton into the city of Scranton. The first step in the process is that Scranton must approve the transfer of the liquor license to come in to the boundaries of the city of Scranton. That's the first step. They have an application pending before the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board to convert that into a restaurant. They have to have a dining room. They have to have a kitchen. Um, all of that would be inspected by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board before the license would be operative. They cannot be a package store. That's a delicatessen license. Um, if that, they had a delicatessen license, then they could um, just serve beer and not alcohol, um, either within the premise or, I forget if you can take two six packs of beer and three quarts or four quarts uh, at a, you know, with the, uh, with the deli license. A restaurant can do the same thing. You know, a restaurant can sell two six packs to any person to, you know, to, to take off the premises, right. or they can sell four quarts of beer. Uh, <clears throat> So that the fact that if, if you do approve this tonight, all that you are approving is the fact that this license can be transferred from another municipality into the city of Scranton to this specific address. Everything else then comes into play. For them to go in and to get a building permit or to go in to get, they have to comply with the zoning regulations to put a bar in, now you have 30 seats, I don't know offhand what, <laughs> you know how many parking spaces you have to have right. for every so many seats in a bar. But they'd have to have that many parking spaces. They'd have to have, you know, everything to comply with the zoning. They'd have to get the permits to put a kitchen in. You know, it'd have to meet all the requirements of the city in order to have a kitchen, exhaust fans and everything else for the kitchen. Then the Liquor Control Board would come in and they'd actually measure everything you know, on the, what their application is, how big it is. They count the tables and the chairs. You cannot count the bar stools because they don't qualify as seats for a restaurant even though you could eat at the bar. <laughs> so they would have to have, you know, I, 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 I don't know anything about the, about, you know, about the business plan right. for this, but it has to be a restaurant. Okay. It right. has to be if it's a restaurant license. It, so, and, it, and it is a restaurant license, so they're going to have to convert this premises into a fully operational restaurant in accordance with the rules of the Liquor Control Board, in accordance with the city's zoning code, and in accordance with, you know, the city's building codes. So I, 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 you, you've, you've kind of answered the, the if, if we approve this transfer, they can't they can't now open the next tomorrow. Day open. No, what they have okay. to do now that they have there would be other there would be other formalities and safeguards. Lots of them. <laughs> to before it would be open. I, I have no idea where this is on Greenridge Street. Uh, um, you know, and even even what it was. Uh, but they're going to have to convert it into being a fully operational restaurant in order that, to get the liquor license. Well, thank you. That that that's. Thank you very much for that information. Uh, Mr. McGough, I, I have a little more information on, on that as well. And I know Attorney Hughes is absolutely right legally with, you know, there has to be so many chairs, there has to be, you know, an op fully operational kitchen, but many six-pack stores that are, that you or I would consider a six-pack store have this type of license. They'll okay. do maybe takeout pizza and have, and now most of their business will be takeout, but they'll have the required amount of chairs. And a lot of these take out pizza places or restaurants, we all know that they're really six-pack stores. And I believe the law is, an attorney who's correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's you could take out 144 ounces. I, I, it's two six-packs, that means you had to be 12 by 12, it'd be 144 ounces. Yeah. Yeah. So you could take out 144 ounces at one time. If you were to go there and buy five 12-packs, you'd have to go in, pay for a 12-pack, walk to your car, yeah, go, back, put it in, go back in. And also, one of the things that the residents brought up to me that they were very concerned about was right behind this building, or another restaurant just opened. So you'll have, if this goes through, 
you'll have a restaurant slash six pack store cigar shop on facing Main Ave on the corner of Main and Gardner, I believe it's Gardner. And then directly behind that, you'll have another restaurant that was just in front of the zoning board. Um, and there was some controversy with that. I believe the objection was withdrawn at the last minute. Um, you would have that restaurant right there, and there was issues with parking already. And I, I know from, I drive past this location all the time, there's very little parking there. But I'm sorry to butt it. We can discuss no, that's this fine. more. We can discuss this more when we get to. That's to fine. And more this information. This is 200 Greenridge Street. So it must be down by the Price Chopper somewhere in that area. I don't. 200 Greenridge Street. Yeah, but it's uh, by the Giant Market. By the Giant. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. It's right on the corner of um, it, the CVS Giant. Right. It's right. Um, right on Greenridge Street there. So there, there's no parking on Greenridge Street in that area. And there's a small lot off to the side. Right. But again, the parking is an issue for zoning. It's not for an issue for us. Um, no, that, that's for zoning and you know for the building permits and everything yeah. else. But the, the thing is that if they have a fully operational restaurant, then they can have takeout food and everything else. Yeah. Uh, and they can sell up to two six packs of beer, uh, you know, to go. But they're going to have to have 30 seats in that restaurant. It's going to have to be a fully operational restaurant. Yeah. Right. Um, I, if, if I could inject, um, Attorney Francis O'Brien, who represents uh, Big House Tobacco, called our office this afternoon in response to our earlier request, and he informed us that his client, Big House Tobacco, will be complying with all Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board regulations as they move forward in the application process for a liquor license. He's available for any questions council may have. In addition, Attorney O'Brien said he is a former solicitor for the State Liquor Control Board and that this is the only type of work he handles. As, as I mentioned before, legally, there's, there's, I'm not questioning whether it's legal or not because there's just a way to get around of having a restaurant license. Yeah, it's the intent because a lot of, it's mostly pizza shops um, that do, or sometimes even convenience stores, you'll go in and you'll see a bunch of chairs in the middle of a convenience store. They'll have a kitchen, they'll sell hoagies, they'll have a menu, but we all know 90% of the business coming out of there is liquor. Or it's not, not liquor, one. it's Very beer. Good sandwiches. <laughs> Boar's head roast beef, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but. Um, uh, well, thank you for yeah. all of the input. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to, <clears throat> and it was made mention of here, was the uh, and, and I don't often mention the newspaper. Um, other people have that fight. Um, but I read the, the Times editorial on the commuter tax, and, and I will say that you know, I, I was in partial agreement with much of what they said, especially the, the section on the alternative, uh, alternatives to the commuter tax. The problem is that the editorial never said that these were things that we have already considered. You know, everything that they had as a solution or an alternative was something that's already been discussed. And most of what they put in as alternatives were third party, you know, required third party reliance. Is the state going to restructure um, how the schools are funded, and been talking about it for decades. I don't think that's going to happen. You know, is the state going to approve a sales tax? I don't know. You know, that's something that they've put off at least until next year. You know, so all of these things that the editorial included were already things that we've discussed and, and realized that we cannot rely on those going forward. And we needed to create an alternative. And the alternative is this commuter tax. And, and the other thing I wanted to say on the commuter tax is that um, in, in doing this, one of the things that people need to consider is the demographics of the city of Scranton. 
it's somewhere, the average age of a citizen in the city of Scranton is somewhere over 60. Many of them retired. I'd love to see the percentage of people, citizens, that are actually retired. I'm, I'm sure it's pretty high. So we're talking about people on fixed incomes, you know, be looking at having what could be onerous tax increases. On the other hand, you have a population that many have moved out of the city, gone to outlying communities, and yet work in the city. They come to the city of Scranton to make their money. They come to the city, of, when they come here to make their money, they rely on the services that are provided. And I think that there should be some responsibility there. Um, and, and again, as somebody mentioned, this is not, you know, this is not an, a forever situation. The commuter tax has to be approved yearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would hope that after one year it was gone. But at this time, I firmly believe that this is something that the city of Scranton needs. I think it's something that, if you looked at it logically, um, yes, is it a burden on some people? Absolutely. But we all face a burden. And the other thing, the city, the city of Scranton is the focal point of the entire area. And many people in this Lackawanna County and surrounding counties depend upon the city of Scranton for their livelihood and, and for many of the services that they receive. And I would hope that people realize that and, and that while there may be some opposition to this commuter tax, I would hope that people understand the reasons why we are looking to implement it. Um, and one very last thing, uh, as far as I know, the fireworks that were um, at NAOG this past year were at no cost to the city. They were all sponsored. I may be wrong, but it, that was the last I checked that was the case. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McGough. And I, I echo all of your comments regarding the commuter tax. The only thing I'd like to add, though, about uh, the editorial was the fact that it focuses only on city council, as if city council solely governs the city of Scranton. I wish that were the case. Many things would have been different for the last three years, believe me. But the fact of the matter is, this is a joint effort between the mayor and his administration and Scranton City Council. And Powell and DCED provide their input. And in fact, they approved that revised recovery plan. So to single out Scranton City Council and say, this is all you, and look what you're doing, you know, that's completely inaccurate. It's city government, both branches of city government, in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Economy League and the State Department of Community and Economic Development. So it would be nice if the editorialist uh, would check the facts, because certainly everyone has a right to his and her opinion, but everyone doesn't have the right to their own set of facts. The facts are the facts overall. And I think what's been happening is uh, we've been substituting in editorials opinions for facts. Uh, I did say partially agreed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And Councilman Rogan, do you have comments or motions? Yes, thank you. 
And uh, again, I apologize for my absence the last few weeks, and I, I thank everyone for the cards and phone calls and messages. I'm feeling much better. I'm glad to be back and back at work um, for you. Um, just a few comments about some of the things that were mentioned and some of the agenda items. I'll be relatively brief. Um, it was mentioned by a few residents about the 8.9% interest on the unfunded debt. And I was very upset when I read this as well. And when we had the vote on the unfunded debt, one of my concerns at that point in time was we, there was no set interest rate. It's the vote is first, and then you find out the details later. That's a big part of the reason why I opposed it. Um, also, because the mayor went back on his word when we met privately that it would be the end of the line for borrowing in the city, which we obviously see that that, that isn't the case. But maybe 10 years ago, an 8.9% interest rate on a loan wouldn't have been that bad. But right now, interest rates are at historic lows. Um, as somebody who's looking to purchase a home in the city of Scranton, and you put in different banks looking for an interest, you know, for, for a mortgage, and you're getting interest rates at 3.5 to 4% as an individual who has very few assets other than maybe a vehicle, and then you have a city who's getting interest rates of 9%. It, it seems out of whack, especially with how relatively low interest rates are in general. Those that have savings accounts in banks realize they're getting you know, a fraction of a percentage. Actually, it's not even keeping up with inflation, the, the interest you get on your savings account these days. But um, the rate is very high. And hope, I'm hopeful that on the next issue will be it will be significantly lower, but it probably won't be. I understand the city needs the money, but uh, a 9% interest rate is, uh, is very high. Um, a bit of better news, I heard um, from talking to a few, few people today that um, Kevin Conway will be um, working for the parking, parking authority under Central Parking, and he worked for, uh, from what I hear from Mayor Connors, and he did an excellent job um, when he was working with uh, under Mayor Connors. I've heard nothing, I haven't met him yet, but I've heard nothing but positive things about him and, and I'm hopeful that things will move in the right direction with the parking authority. Um, I know I, for one, I, I'm very happy that Mr. Scopoletti and the extremely incompetent management down there is gone. And it, it's a tough pill to swallow in the short term and employees Good employees have gotten laid off as well with the incompetent management. And, and that's frustrating. It's not right. But we have to look long term. You know, it's not a matter of, you know, just continuing to let them borrow and run wild. Where at the end of the day, the chickens are going to come home to roost, and, and they have. But long term, I, I firmly believe that we're in a better position now with the parking authority than we were a year ago when. This wasn't even in anybody's mind. Um, moving on, a few other items. Um, I'm very happy with um, the CDBG amendments, and I thank everyone for sending in the recommendation. It seems that pretty much everyone was on the same page with, with what we wanted to do, and I'm very proud that with this amendment, we're actually able to increase the funding for paving in low to moderate income areas by over 100% which is something I think everybody in the city agrees that we desperately need. Um, we increased the allotment from 300,000 to 645,000 um, through these amendments. And one of the big savings was um, the elimination of splash, pack, splash parks or splash pads for pools. Um, and many of us had that in the suggestion list and it was mentioned from the podium as well regarding the capital budget. You know, I, I grew up in West Side. I still live in West Side. I'll, I'll probably live in West Side my entire life. And I remember as a child going to Novembrino Pool. And, you know, it wasn't the, in, an immaculate pool, but you went, you paid, I think it was a dollar back then. And sometimes, sometimes it was free. And you went, you swam in the pools. They had two pools there. You know, it was nice. It was nice for the neighborhood kids that we all get together and go down there. And, you know, it, it's a great pool. It's in a great area. For, for West Side, and the same thing within in other areas of the city, Pine Brook, you know, throughout the whole city. Pool, a pool is a great place for kids to go. We don't need a splash park or a splash pad. 
if we just maintain the pools that we have, I think we're, we'll be in a lot better shape than you know, completely taking everything out and putting in um, these splash pads, which, to be honest with you, I think most people don't even know what they look like. Um, I don't. Also, some other changes that were made, um, some other reductions. I mentioned these earlier. I just want to talk a little more in detail now why they were made. Um, deduction was made for the uh, Boys and Girls Club. This wasn't for programs at the Boys and Girls Club. It was for sidewalk repairs. So it will not affect any of the programs. It's just for, for their sidewalk <coughs> repairs. Um, they were three of the bigger deductions. Um, the, uh, some of the other additions, one was, like, as was mentioned earlier, Lackawanna Neighbors for housing rehab. Um, we absolutely need to do something in our neighborhoods about blight. I think we all know that. Um, it is a small increase, but hopefully it, it will help. Um, Scranton tomorrow, I, I spoke to Mr. McGough this morning, and uh, that was put in as well for a business master plan for the downtown. And then in the public service area, the two deductions were one from the United Neighborhood Center, the school program. Um, it was on a couple members' deductions to take that off, and, and I took eliminated to zero because of a question two years ago that I posed to Mr. Handley when he was here asking if any assurances were made to be sure that anyone in this program, which is an English as a second language program, is in fact in the country legally. And those assurances weren't, weren't made two years ago. So that was eliminated. Um, the Deutsch Institute was reduced by $5,000. We need to find some extra money in uh, one of the programs to fund the adult literacy, which we, we all support it. And it was um, removed from the recreation activities portion of the Deutsch, Deutsch Institute. And as I said, the two additions, one was for the adult literacy program, which um, helps train um, adults to read, do job applications, things of that nature, so they could take care of themselves, which is uh, something I believe is a good use of taxpayer dollars. We're helping somebody help themselves instead of just giving a handout. And then the NeighborWorks NEPA, the home ownership program, um, we've all seen the foreclosures throughout the country and in the area as well. And uh, it's very hard for people to, to keep their homes and to purchase homes these days. So that's why, why that was increased as well. So I'm hopeful that, th that these will pass, and I'm very happy with, with how everything came together. I remember do, the first time we did this, about three years ago now, the list of amendments was four pages long, because when they came down, they had you know, theater tickets, this and that. And I think um, the administration is taking note of how council wants to appropriate those funds. And I see that these items weren't even included this year. So that's why the amendments are much more condensed, which was, which was nice that it seems it's already going in the right direction. And then we just tweaked it a little bit. Um, I just want to, uh, just to add to what you said. Uh, in total, uh, I think I, I added it up. There's over $500,000 devoted to housing rehab or in neighborhood improvement. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that's an important uh, factor to to mm -hmm. mention. Absolutely, and um, you know, just honoring Mr. Quinn's request, uh, Mrs. Craig, with my colleague's permission, could we please send a letter to Linda Abley and Mayor Doherty, requesting a meeting at their convenience um, to discuss housing rehabilitation in our neighborhoods. Um, I understand why Mr. Quinn is frustrated. We all are too. Um, it's very frustrating walking through a neighborhood, and those of us who you know, were campaigning going door to door, you see firsthand how many houses are vacant. Even some that are in good shape are vacant. And I think if we could get to those homes early in the process, before they're vacant for 10, 15 years, and they deteriorate and they have to be torn down, if those properties could be rehabbed early in the process. Number one, it'll be better for our community We'll have more properties on the tax rolls. Be good for low to moderate income families to move into them, to have that pride of home ownership. And also not to have to waste money tearing them down when you could be building them up. So hopefully um, the mayor and Ms. Abley will, will honor that request and come in. Um, that's all I have for now. I will comment more on the agenda items as they come up. Thank you. Thank you. And, um 
I may also suggest to you that uh, if you were able to perhaps uh, get your hands on CDBG allocations and home program uh, allocations from other Pennsylvania municipalities uh, and then determine which ones seem to be running those types of programs and funding them strongly, then I think, um, you know, you have something to present to Ms. Abley and the mayor saying, you know, and, and hopefully you'd even be able to speak with someone from the municipality Absolutely. who could better explain it to you and then maybe we can use that as a model to start something new in Scranton. Absolutely, that's a great idea. I could get in touch with some of the similar sized cities. And also, I know in a lot of the rural areas, the CDBG allocation is done by the counties instead of the cities, because it's a rural area. So I, I may even reach out to uh, one of the counties as well, because there's blighted rural communities as well as, as in cities. So I do know a few offhand that, that I could contact that I've, I've contacted on other issues before. So. I'll definitely do that, and I look forward to the meeting. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have comments or motions tonight? Yes, uh, just briefly. I promise this time. <laughs> uh, I, I really wasn't going to make any comments, but I do have to agree with Mr. McGough and uh, Mrs. Evans regarding the commuter tax. Uh, I think we feel the same way. It's not something we really like to do, but, uh, you know, we're trying to do the best we can. As Mr. McGough stated, we, you know, we have come up with other ideas, but uh, there's still things in the works. A lot of people come to this podium with, with good ideas, um, and we've taken note of many of them. We received some good ones this evening. Uh, the problem is we can't implement them overnight. There's a lot of legal issues that we're checking on some of these things, especially in the pilot end and stuff. But uh, there are some issues that are getting closer because we're not alone in that issue. But as far as uh, the editorial goes on Sunday, uh, from what I remember, one thing I, I, I do take issue in there, and I believe Mrs. Evans said it was, it's their personal opinion. It's not fact, and uh, I think we all realize that. Uh, they're blaming city council, as usual, for everything. But you expect to see that on a Sunday editorial. The problem is they took issue with, the, with us reducing the business privilege and mercantile taxes two years ago and also reducing the property taxes. We tried to help those and bring business back into town. And yes, they could take issue with that. The problem is they didn't look at the fact. The fact and the reason we, we put those in our budget was the, was the reality, uh, well, we found out later the reality that we didn't know that the administration had taken $5 million out of the Workers' Comp Trust Fund. We didn't have uh, full availability of the audit at that time to show where we were. So to chastise us for trying to help the constituents that we represent uh, without all the facts and not basing the facts in that editorial, from an administration that was not providing us with the information. That's the fact. That's the truth. And we're looking, again, we're working together with the administration. Hopefully that situation won't happen again. But I've stated it before, our friends from out of the area, the surrounding communities, um, and they feel like a lot of our own residents, that hey, you know, this tax may go into a black hole. The only thing I can assure you is I think, you know, this panel has been proving itself the last two and a half years. We are watching out um, as much as we can and working for you in the best interest that that money goes where it should go and improves this city and the surrounding area. But I just wanted to, to mention about the, uh, the reason why we reduced the taxes two years ago and uh, just hope that the editorial board would look into it and get that straight. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have comments or motions? Yes, I do. 
Yesterday, I took the opportunity to attend and testify at the City of Scranton's hearing to petition the Court of Common Pleas to borrow $9.75 million in unfunded debt. Many may be wondering, why does the City need to petition the Court for $9.75 million of unfunded debt? As reported under testimony by our business administrator, Ryan McGowan, the City needs to borrow $9.7 million 9.75 million dollars for the following reasons due to unforeseeable circumstances. Number one, in the adopted budget there was 6.4 million dollars in savings to be realized from the refinancing of pre-existing debt. Mayor Doherty stated in a meeting with Fidelity Bank late last year that 6.4 million dollars would be able to be saved if the city could refinance the pre-existing debt early enough in 2012. As one may or may not know, the refinancing of pre-existing debt did not happen early enough to realize the savings, forcing the city to pay on the pre-existing loans that it could not refinance. The total amount of savings lost that the city had to pay in debt service payments was approximately $5.3 million. Number two, back in April, the city borrowed $1.5 million from the Workers' Compensation Trust Fund. In case one, does not, er, in case one is not familiar with the Workers' Compensation Trust Fund rules and regulations, as part of the agreement, the Workers' Compensation Trust Fund must be funded 75% in order to be compliant with the trust agreement. Before the borrowing of $1.5 million from the fund, it was compliant with the 75% funded threshold. After the $1.5 million was borrowed from the trust fund, subsequently, as one could predict, the fund was $1.5 million short. Originally, the $1.5 million was repaid back, or was to be repaid back to the Workers' Compensation Trust Fund on May 31st of this year. Because of the city's cash position, this could not be done. The deadline to pay back the fund was extended until July 31st. However, because of the city's cash, cash position, this day could not be met. Currently, the deadline to repay the Workers' Compensation Trust Fund has been extended until the end of the year to repay back the $1.5 million that the city had borrowed from the fund back in April. Number three. Due to the October 2011 State Supreme Court Arbitration Award, which was ruled in favor of the fire and police unions, there are certain requirements as to how many police officers are to be working on a shift at all times. The city failed to budget properly for this requirement. As a result, as reported by Business Administrator Ryan McGowan, the city is expected to have an overage of $800,000 in police overtime by the end of the year. Number four, there is $1.6 million in various fees, damages, and costs owed to the police union related to a recent arbitration ruling that the city agreed to pay in settlement negotiations. Number five, there is $197,000 in various fees and costs owed to the fire union related to a recent arbitration ruling that the city agreed to pay in settlement negotiations. Number six, there's a $662,000 difference in the amount of delinquent garbage fees that was budgeted by the administration to be collected this year. The amount that was budgeted to be collected was $950,000, and that amount uh, has not been nearly realized. The amount collected so far was two, er, is $288,000. The reason why this gap exists is due to the fact that it has taken some time to get Northeast Revenue on board in regard to um, the collection of delinquent garbage fees. The reason it has taken some time to get Northeast Revenue on board is due to the fact that the city had to resolve many problems with the data submitted by the prior delinquent refuse collection firm being uh, NCC. Number seven. A possible $400,000 related to the Scranton Parking Authority. 
This includes $100,000 for meter enforcement personnel that are now being paid directly by the City of Scranton and working for the City of Scranton directly and a possible $300,000 that may have to be paid for the Scranton Parking Authority's December bond payment. The amount of money that the city may have to contribute may differ from the $300,000 depending on how much money that the SPA's court-appointed receiver may be able to contribute. Number eight, there are closing costs that are expected to be incurred in, the second, in securing a second unfunded debt. The recent borrowing of $11.32 million incurred $542,000 of costs. The projected costs that our business administrator, Ryan McGowan, um, compiled was $500,000. Though he does believe there is a possibility it may be quite lower. Number nine. There's a $190,000 shortfall in the projection of real estate transfer tax revenue for the end of the year. This shortfall stems from the sale in early January of the former Moses Taylor Hospital to CHS, Community Health Systems. The sale of the hospital occurred before the ordinance was passed to adopt a higher real estate transfer tax rate for 2012. Subsequently, though the hospital was sold in 2012, the transfer tax that CHS had to pay was based on the 2011 real estate transfer tax rate. Number 10, due to health and safety issues, particularly with fire protection in the East Mountain area and slow response times, there were additional firefighters hired back to the city of Scranton in order to reopen the East Mountain Fire Station. Though the rehiring of the additional firefighters was later covered by the SAFER grant, it did cost $200,000 to bring back the additional firefighters before the grant was received. Number 11, there's a projected shortfall of $1.4 million in license, inspection, and permit revenues than what was actually received so far. In the amount of money that the administration budgeted for licenses, inspections, and permit revenue, it was projected that Geisinger and CHS would be undergoing projects relating to the hospital. However, those projects, which would generate a substantial amount of money through permit fees and licenses, did not occur. Number 12, as one may or may not know, the city was to save $600,000 in health insurance costs through a retiree drug subsidy program. Unfortunately, the city was unable to enroll in the, drug retire, or the retiree drug subsidy program at the beginning of the year. In fact, the city was unable to enroll in the retiree drug subsidy program until June. Because of the city being unable to enroll in the retiree drug subsidy program at the beginning of the year, it lost out on $300,000 worth of savings. Overall, the grand total of the 12 points that Ryan McGowan testified to amounts to $13,049,000. Though this amount is higher than the $9.75 million, the city believes that the $9.75 million is the most that the city will be able to access in the financial markets. In other news tonight, as one may or may not know, $11.32 million of borrowing has been awarded to the city from Janie Montgomery Scott. At a recent Pennsylvania Economy League meeting, or Pell meeting, our business administrator Ryan McGowan reported what some of the uses of the $11.32 million would be. Of the $11.32 million, Approximately $1.1 million will be used to fund debt service payments associated with the $6.4 million that the city was projected to save through refinancing. Of course, since $1.1 million of the 11.32 will be used to fund the savings that was to be realized through refinancing, this constitutes the $5.3 million of savings that the city did not realize. Also, of the $11.32 million, $1 million will be used to repay Penn Star Bank. As one may or may not know, 
the Scranton Redevelopment Authority took out a loan regarding the advanced sale of delinquent taxes for the years of 2004, 2005, and 2006, which it defaulted on. The City of Scranton guaranteed this loan. Northeast Revenue has been submitting delinquent tax revenue that it has been collect collecting to Penn Star Bank. However, there's still a great deal of money owed on the defaulted loan. As just stated, in order to clear the default, $1 million is still owed that will be paid out of the $11.32 million. Along with this, currently there are $3.4 million in encumbered accounts payable. Quite simply, the city must catch up on its bills. Out of the $11.32 million received, $3.45 million will be used to pay encumbered accounts payable. In addition, out of the $11.32 million, $1 million must be repaid back to the state of Pennsylvania for a loan that the state recently provided to the city of Scranton. Finally, out of the remaining portion of the $11.32 million, future payables and payroll will need to be paid. And um, just to quickly comment, I know Councilman Rogan made a comment about the interest rate of the unfunded borrowing being 9%. But quite frankly, in the situation that Scranton is in, that is the best interest rate that we had that we got so essentially if we didn't receive this money we wouldn't be able to pay our bills we wouldn't be able to make payroll and the city would go in a downward spiral so this is something that the city desperately needed and this was something that I voted yes for and to conclude I have a few citizens requests First, regarding uh, Greenbush and Reese Street, an employee of the Career Technology Center has informed me that the condition of Greenbush and Reese Streets are subpar to say the least. As one may or may not know, Greenbush and Reese Streets are not only residential streets in the city of Scranton, but are also entrances and exits to the Career Technology Center. The employee of the CTC reports that there are potholes on Greenbush and Reese Street so large that one almost has to come to a complete stop to get through because they are completely across the whole road. With this in mind, Mrs. Craig, um, please contact Director Dewar and ask him to rectify the situation in the best way he sees fit. Residents of Dixon Avenue in Green Ridge report that there are numerous deep potholes on the 1700 block of Dixon Avenue making travel conditions very difficult. Uh, Mrs. Craig, with this in mind, please add this to the list of issues to address with Director Dewar. And residents of Green Ridge also report that there is a street light out on Dixon Avenue, making the area a haven for suspicious activity at night. The poll number to the street light is 57558N46800. Mrs. Craig, with this in mind, please contact Meshalot Electric and ask them to repair the light as soon as possible. And that's all for tonight. Thank you. Good evening. As part of tonight's agenda, Council will vote to introduce legislation to execute and apply for a grant application by the City of Scranton on behalf of Lace Building Associates, LP. Uh, LBA to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development for a local share account grant pursuant to the Pennsylvania Racehorse Development and Gaming Act in the amount of $555,000. I have requested a public caucus with representatives of Lace Building Associates and Ms. Abley, OECD Director, in order to receive an update on the progress that has been achieved to date on this project in Lower Green Ridge and to discuss the proposed uses of this second state grant. My hope is to conduct the caucus next Thursday, November 1st at 6 o'clock p.m. Also on our agenda this evening is the seventh order vote on the 2013 action plan and council's amendments to it as well as the return to the table in seventh order 
of the legislation regarding an OECD loan to 520 Madison Associates LLP. OECD Director Abley indicated that the business name on the loan application was completed incorrectly by the applicant and is now resubmitted accurately. Next, Berkheimer's earned income tax collection requires attention at this time. It appears that 2012 should have been a sizably increased collection year for EIT since the city receives single tax office 2011 collections and Berkheimer 2012 collections. Furthermore, the added authority of Act 32 allows Berkheimer to collect the full amount due at source. Yet Berkheimer had collected only approximately 1.4 million more than the single tax office who collects only delinquencies as of the third week in October. Timely ability to collect all taxes as the law permits is vital to our survival as a city. Thus, please send a letter to the business administrator and the mayor from city council to inform them of council's concern regarding the 2012 EIT collections, Mrs. Craig. Also vital to the city's financial solvency is accountability for revenue received in city offices. Each department head must be accountable for his department's revenue collections. Although other agencies such as Northeast Revenue Service and Berkheimer are collecting certain designated revenues, it is the department heads who must monitor these funds as they are received. In addition, department heads should notify the mayor, business administrator, and city council immediately when an issue with any category of revenue collection occurs. From rental registration to permit and license fees to parking meter revenue, to taxes, among others. Equally important, all outside agencies collecting City of Scranton taxes, such as Berkheimer, should submit monthly reports to the business administrator, mayor, city council, and city controller. Mrs. Craig, please forward uh, a memo to Mr. McGowan from City Council requesting that as business administrator he direct all outside agencies to submit monthly reports to the aforementioned parties. Now, I'm quite certain that the BA himself would receive these reports, but I know that City Council does not. I'm uh, of the mind that the city controller doesn't receive them, uh, and possibly the mayor. Uh, also, please send a letter to the mayor asking that he direct department heads to notify Scranton City Council when their respective revenue collections are negatively impacted. Uh, next, council received a response from Acting Police Chief Graziano regarding the Zone nightclub in North Scranton. Uh, it reads, in response to the attached letter regarding the Zone nightclub in North Scranton, this location has been the scene of 43 police calls in 2011 and 35 calls to date in 2012. As of this week, the owner of this establishment has offered to hire off-duty uniformed Scranton police officers while the club is open. Whether we will be able to fill these positions is yet to be determined. In any event, we will continue to take enforcement actions there when warranted. Council thanks Chief Graziano for his action in this matter and for his timely response. Uh, finally, after receiving numerous complaints concerning Kane Street in Scranton, I was pleased to learn that the DPW performed extensive road patchwork in Southside last week, particularly on Kane Street between Stafford and South Webster Avenues. I was told the DPW used a front end loader in its attempt to permanently repair a gash in the road near the Econo Lodge 
that was nearly half the width of the road. Southside residents, visitors to cemeteries in this location, and Scranton City Council wish to thank the DPW for its fine work. And uh, Mrs. Craig, if you would please send a letter to Ms. Abley to request an update on the park located in the 500 block of Lackawanna Avenue. And that's it. Could I just add one that you sure. reminded me of something? Um, somebody contacted me about uh, the corner of Main Avenue and Far Street that there were overhanging trees that made it very difficult as you were coming down Far Street, if you look to the right, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for oncoming traffic, that the trees blocked that. And uh, the person that asked me about this, it was at a supermarket, and I don't know how to contact her other, other than to say that I have contacted DPW. They are aware of the situation. And when they have the manpower and the wherewithal, they will rectify the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Craig? 5B, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and apply for a grant application by the city of Scranton on behalf of Lace Building Affiliates, LP, LBA, to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development for a local share account grant pursuant to the Pennsylvania Racehorse Development and Gaming Act for a real estate development project located at 1315 Milard Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania to execute and enter into a local share account grant contract if approved with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to accept and utilize the grant in the amount of $555,000 if awarded by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the project to be known as Scranton Lace Redevelopment Project. At this time, we'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, I, I'm glad that you have asked for a caucus with that. I think there are a couple of questions that I, that I had. Um, Particularly in terms of timeline, um, I, I think we've seen any number of projects where money has been received and yet never used. Yeah, well, that, we that the project has results. never been um, taken or you know, taken on. Um, and the other thing I think that we should look at is what other funding is you know is there for that that project, and will it move through the phases in a timely manner? Mm -hmm. I agree. I Thank agree. you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 6A, reading by title, file of council number 64, 2012, an ordinance approving the transfer of a restaurant liquor license currently owned by Colonies Incorporated, trading as Little Mickey's Pasta House. 77 Fallbrook Street, Carbondale, Pennsylvania, 18407, license number R-14028, to pass Rush LLC for use at Big House Tobacco Outlet, located at 200 Greenridge Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18509, as required by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question. Yes. Um, I, I know we had an explanation as to um, what this process was. I, I still have um, some serious reservations about this project, um, and especially in, in light of what Mr. Rogan said, that there was there was some involvement with the state over um, improper taxing, and um, if, if that is the type of, if that's the type of operation that we're looking at, then um, I, I don't, I don't want to be involved in allowing it to, you know, move to some other direction, uh, and uh, unless I plan on voting no, if, if there are other people that you know, want this to to pass, uh, perhaps uh, 
my vote would change had there, you know, had we gotten more information, especially from the, the people applying. Well, we have, it's in sixth order tonight, and so it would, if it passed, it would move into seventh order next week. Um, I could suggest that uh, we meet with or speak with Attorney O'Brien and pose all of the concerns and questions to him directly. I, I would say I, I'm not comfortable voting yes this week either. Um, if he were to come in, you know, maybe 15 minutes before and, you know, try to address, or the owner uh, of the property even more so than the attorney because I, and I don't know if, if you agree with me on this, but I'm not questioning the legality of the permit. Um, from the neighbors I talked to, they seem opposed to it. One of them that's opposed to it's out of town. The other, one of the other ones is working tonight. And, you know, it's difficult for people to get to the meetings. But I have no doubt that it will be done lawfully. But as I said before, many of these restaurant permits aren't really in restaurants. They, they become six-pack stores. And, you know, I envision it as a place for people to go and get a pack of cigarettes and a 12-pack of beer. I don't think Scranton needs a, another one of those establishments, especially when I, I know that neighborhood. There's one that just opened. You're traveling up towards North Scranton Junior High. If you make a right, maybe two blocks, there's one. And then if you make a left, in Bullshead, you have the convenience store, which offers the same service. So within not even a mile radius, you have two that I could think of. But if, if he could come in and persuade me otherwise, I, I'm willing to listen. But it's, it's going to take a lot of persuasion. <laughs> Madam President, if I could, I think if you remember, it wasn't too long ago when Posh, right across the street in the Scranton Club, mm -hmm. um, they transferred a license uh, from outside of Scranton. Um, the owners were here. Their attorney, Greg Pascal, was here. Uh, they made a presentation exactly what they were going to do. Uh, they, if, if they had a public liquor license uh, when they leased uh, the first and second floor of the Scranton, Scranton Club, uh, I would suggest that, you know, I, I was kind of dismayed that the, that the owners weren't even here tonight to make some type of presentation on this. Um, I think that, I, I believe that, that Attorney O'Brien told Mrs. Craig that had he known about this, that he would have come up from Harrisburg. Um, I'd only suggest to counsel that, uh, that tell him that there'll be another hearing next week or to come, you know, at the, at the regular meeting and to make a presentation on this, to exactly what it is and clear it up. Um, attorney, is it the owner or the attorney that lives in Harrisburg? Uh, the attorney. The attorney. The attorney. I, I would be... I would prefer actually to hear from the owner than, than the attorney. Well, as I said, when Posh was here, was both, both. You know, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the, the two owners of Posh were here with the attorney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I was kind of dismayed that, you know, nobody was here tonight. Uh, you know, if there's a public hearing, uh, I, I thought that they would have been here to make their presentation as to exactly what it is and why this liquor license should be transferred from outside of, of Scranton into Scranton. Would, and the burden is on them. I mean, you know, that's, that's what it comes down to. Would it be acceptable to, I guess I could, I could accept uh, putting it into seventh order and once mm -hmm. it's placed into seventh order, tabling it until such a time as? Unless, of course, they can come next week. Well, I, I, I would just assume table it in, in case they can't, and right. you know, then it's not on for seventh order. And, uh, we can place it. Would that be? I would think I if, would if, if they can't be here well. next week, if the business means that much to them, you think they would do everything they can to come. And with budget time coming up soon, that will take up, I would assume, the bulk of discussion at the meetings. Um, again, I'm not comfortable voting for it, but if, again, if they, somebody can Neither am I, but it, it it's me. not in seventh order. Right. Um, I, I, think, I think we should... Um, do our due diligence, you know, as, as I suggested and our solicitors suggested, uh, request their presence at a public caucus and um, if they attend and they explain, then we can consider this. If they fail to attend, 
they, they should have, as attorney, he said they should have been here today. It was right. publicly advertised. Right, but we did, I know in the case of Posh, we did actually conduct the public caucus with them. Yeah. So we had not set up a caucus. So uh, I think we should do that and uh, see if they could come in. I would think they should bring blueprints and everything else. I mean, if they, mm -hmm. you know, that they, they should have it laid out exactly what it's going to be. Is it going, right. to, be a, is it going to be a takeout restaurant? Uh, you know, like, you know, some of these have, or is it really going to be a restaurant? Mm -hmm. And they should have plans. Yes. And while we're inviting them to come in, I would like to see some sort of proof um, that they have paid permit fees for the work that they're doing on the premises now. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I said. I think there are still serious questions. I, I guess I would be willing to vote for it tonight, but um, as Mr. Rogan said, it would take some serious persuasion to, to have me vote yes in, in seventh order. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh order, 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Public Safety or Adoption, file of Council Number 63, 2012, amending file of the Council Number 46, 2012, an ordinance entitled Amending File of Council Number 33, 2012, entitled Establishing a No Parking Zone in the 900 block of North Washington Avenue, State Route 3023, on the westernmost side of said street, pursuant to the highway occupancy permit application of the Commonwealth Medical College from State Route 3023, Segment 90, Offset 1000, to State Route 3023, Segment 90, Offset 1219, for a distance of 219 feet to correct the incorrectly identified segment numbers of State Route 3023, to correct the incorrectly identified offset numbers for the no parking zone. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Public Safety? Ms. Chairperson for the Committee on Public Safety, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Lasko? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. I would like to make a motion to amend item 7B as per the following changes. Changes in general fund items. City of Scranton, OECD. CDBG administration costs. Amended to $385,000. Boys and Girls Club, sidewalk repairs amended to $32,788. City of Scranton Public Parks and, Rec Parks and Recreation, Splash Pool Parks, $0. Increases, Lackawanna Neighbors, Housing Rehabilitation, $332,000. City of Scranton DPW, Road Paving, $645,000. Scranton Tomorrow, Business Master Plan, $10,000. United Neighborhood Centers, this is a reduction in a public safety. United Neighborhood Centers, SCOLA program, $0. Deutsch Institute, recreation activities, $15,000. Additions to public safety item, public service items. EOTC, adult literacy program, $15,000. NeighborWorks NEPA, home ownership program, $10,000. We have a motion to amend item 7B. Do we have a second? Second. second. On the question, all those in favor of the motion to amend item 7B signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. What is the recommendation of the <coughs> chair for the Committee on Community Development? It hasn't been Do we need to read it first? Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I was supposed to read it before Mr. Rogan started, uh -huh. so. My mistake. That's okay. <laughs> that's I gave me a break. 
So we'll just consider this the reading of it then? Is yes. that fine? Okay. For consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, file of Council Number 56, 2012, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate officials of the City of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant CDBG Program, Home Investment Partnership Home Program, and Emergency Solutions Grant ESG Program for the period beginning January 1, 2013. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Chair for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of Item 7B. Second. As amended. As amended. Yes. Second. On the question, roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare Item 7B as amended, legally and lawfully adopted. I would like to make a motion to take resolution number 44, 2012 from the table. Second. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. For adoption, resolution number 44, 2012, previously tabled authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials for the city of Scranton to enter into a loan agreement and make a loan from the Community Development Block Grant Program, project number 150.35, in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to 520 Madison Avenue Associates, LLC, to assist an eligible project. I make a motion to amend item 7C by deleting Exhibit A, Loan Agreement, and inserting Corrected Exhibit A, Loan Agreement, submitted by OECD Office, Monday, October 22nd, 2012. In the summary title, after Madison, delete Avenue. In the second whereas clause, fifth line, after Madison, delete Avenue. In the now therefore clause, fourth line, after Madison, delete Avenue. Second. On the question? All those in favor of the motion to amend item 7C signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7C as amended. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C as amended, legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.